I want to tell you a little bit about the Science Gateways Community Institute, which brings you this webinar. Um, and I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Essentially, we exist because the National Science Foundation thought that it would be really important for the community of people who build and use Science Gateways to be able to share their experiences, technologies, and best practices with each other. And so we're funded to provide various kinds of services and resources. And we're organized into five areas. And the first area is called the incubator. And the, and the incubator is the uh, area that actually provided the services that Jason will be talking about today. One of the um, big events that it offers is a boot camp at least twice a year, as well as some custom boot camps. And these are a one-week intensive event that um, teaches uh, from is it soup to nuts, I think, is the expression to um, how to help your gateway be sustainable and successful. Also, uh, those people who are involved in the boot camp are available as consultants, including usability consulting, which is another thing that Jason will be talking about today. Our extended developer support area also provides consulting. And this is hands-on direct consulting help uh, where uh, you can have someone for a quarter time for anywhere from um, six months up to a year to help on some aspect of your project that needs help. The Scientific Software Collaborative is, the, is our area that has produced a gateway catalog. So if you have an existing gateway and you want to let, spread the word about it, you can list it there. You also can list uh, software components that might be useful to gateway developers. And so we have a list of platforms and other um, smaller types of components there on the catalog. Um, and the community engagement and exchange area is uh, is the area that brings you this webinar, as well as our annual conference and various resources on our website. And finally, last but not least, workforce development is is there to support the career paths of young people who are interested in becoming involved in the gateway community as developers or in, in some other role, and um, supports both participation in some of the events that we sp sponsor through other areas, but also um, uh, organizes internships and a summer coding institute um, and other kinds, and hackathons, for example. So that is the Science Gateways Community Institute in a nutshell. And um, I just want to ask a quick favor of all of you who have joined us today. Um, it really helps us to get your feedback, particularly to improve this webinar, but also to let um, the National Science Foundation know how we're doing. So if you could take 30 seconds at the end of this, or if you have to join early, I'll post the, web the link in the chat section. Um, please let us know both what you thought of this, as well as any suggestions you have for the future. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Claire Sturm, and uh, while um, Jason gets himself set up, and uh, let Claire introduce our guest today. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I apologize for my fantastic sounding voice, but we'll power through this together. So as <laughs> Catherine mentioned, uh, my name is Claire Sturm, and I'm an engagement manager with the SGCI Incubator, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Fleming, the ESGS technology manager who's a part of the SARA project. I had the pleasure of meeting Jason at the second Science Gateways Boot Camp, which, as Catherine mentioned, a week-long workshop that the incubator hosts. Um, and this was back in October of 2017. He was working with his partner, Carol Kaiser, the Sarah Technology Manager from Louisiana State University. And their boot camp experience was an interesting one, for they both were working through the exercises the boot camp was putting on and also gathering data for an oncoming hurricane, which hints a little bit about the project and the work that they do with Sarah. And they've um, gone past the boot camp to work with SGCI further through different consulting efforts, which I'm sure Jason will talk about. Um, but for now, I'm happy to take questions as they come along through the chat, and I'll just interrupt uh, Jason throughout his presentation as they come in. So if you have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat, and I'll share that with Jason. Um, with that, I will go ahead and pass it on to Jason to get started. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, as Claire said, we attended the boot camp. It's been a year now since we attended the, boot, the STCI boot camp. 
in Indiana, and um, we've had a lot of developments since then, but I kind of want to start. Uh, my presentation here is one-third science, one-third gateway, and one-third um, business, so, uh, which includes the consulting that, the, that we've received from, from SGCI. So I'm going to start um, with our uh, start with the nitty-gritty of our technology and sort of work our way up to um, how it gets into the hands of end users and, and why we're doing what we're doing. We have at the basis of our, our technology is the AdCERT post solution model. This it's a physics model. What we do is we divide the coastal ocean into uh, millions of points, and we solve for the shallow water equations at every point. Those points um, are connected in, in triangles, and uh, it's called the finite element method. It's a computational fluid dynamics method for the coastal ocean. And it can be used to solve a lot of different problems, um, search and rescue for if you solve for the tidal currents and the wind-driven currents, and storm surge is another example. Bill tracking is another example. But the AdCERC numerical model only produces numbers. It just produces net CDF output files. It, it doesn't have a user interface of any kind. It's a command line program. The way, uh, the type of data that it ingests, this is uh, a LIDAR data set, a visualization of a LIDAR data set. LIDAR is just raw data, raw survey data. A plane flies over and shoots a laser at the ground and picks up elevation data. So that's kind of the most basic data set that you need for an AdCERC model. This is a, a sand dune on Grand Isle in Louisiana. So we take that information and we put it into the AdCERC model to create what we call a finite element mesh. And that's a representation of the bathymetry and the topography. And then we can use that mesh along with measured data and forecast data for winds and, and tides to predict areas that are, may or may not flood, as well as currents and um, and uh, so inundation and water surface elevation. This is an animation just from the AdCERC model. This is just a toy test case showing um, the type of data that it produces. It can also represent levees as well as roadways and railroad beds, which act like levees during the course of a storm. And when the water wind pushes the water towards shore, it drives water up over the levees and floods areas. And then when the water goes back down, those areas remain flooded uh, because the water can't drain back out very well. So this is just sort of, in a nutshell, the type of data that, that AdCERC can produce. So it, it, the model is itself is scalable. It can run on anything from a PC to a supercomputer, but in order to produce realistic answers for engineering purposes for levy redesign studies, for example, the only way to get to an answer in any reasonable length of time is to use a supercomputer. And the difference between executing one of these models on a, on a desktop and on a supercomputer would be you know, it might take two weeks on a desktop and two hours on a supercomputer. So this model, this AdCERC model, was used in two, up in two, until Hurricane Katrina exclusively for design, so flood risk, storm surge risk, levee design, um, coastal community planning, that sort of thing. It was never used for, you know, online as, as a storm was coming. It had never been used that way before. So I don't know if you can see my um, my pointer, but this is uh, the city of New Orleans. The New Orleans is, is here sort of in the bottom center of the, of the picture. The blue at the top is Lake Pontchartrain, and there are canals that lead out of the city and into Lake Pontchartrain. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had been using this AdCERC model uh, for years to do levee redesign studies. And then when Hurricane Katrina came in 2005, they found that the real-time water level and wind and wave guidance that they had access to as the storm was coming was not sufficient for their needs. They have about 500 floodgates that they have to make decisions about when to open and when to close. And they needed a lot of specific information that they could not get from any other source, including the, the federal government. So. One thing that I always like to point out about our gateway is what we're doing with it and the type of services we provide, we, were, we, we did not cook that up in a lab and try to go out and sell it. The, the use case came to us from the end user, and we've built everything in, 
from then until now, from 2006 until now, everything that we've done that's been successful has always been driven by end user requests. So the core was going after the after the storm, they wanted to shore up these canals and they were going to build gates, uh, floodgates at the entrances to those canals where they lead into like Pontchartrain. But at the time, they were going to be have to be lowered in place with tall cranes because the hydraulic actuation was not finished yet. So they needed real-time guidance for those three locations for wind and water level because the cranes could not operate in high wind. So they wanted wind and water level and they wanted it to be produced by ADSERC. So this is the system that we created in 2006. Uh, the top left here, we take the National Hurricane Center official forecast track, uh, which does not include a, a lot of wind data. It just has like the maximum wind and the location of the storm, but not much else. So we have to take that data, and then here on the top right, we create a vortex, a, a, a wind vortex inside the ADSERC model, and that's those are the winds that we use to drive the water, F equals MA if you remember from um, freshman physics. And uh, and then what we were producing at the time in 2006 when we first started was this plot along the bottom, uh, which is just a plot for those locations of the water level versus time. So it was just a line graph. And actually, it was all running on a supercomputer. And um, it, the program, and I, this ASGS is Adsurc Search Guidance System, it's my creation. It would just email the I had it emailing these plots to, to end users. And so there was no gateway. And, um, and that was OK in 2006 and 2007. It was, those were quiet season, and, and there was not much going on. However, in 2008, when Hurricane Gustav hit, um, we, had, we had a lot of demand. And what happened was we would provide them plots at those three locations, and then every advisory, the Hurricane Center issues a new advisory every six hours. Every advisory, they would say, well, this is good information. What about this other location nearby? What about this other canal? What about this? We have some concerns about a certain floodgate or a certain levee that we're, is under construction, and should we send a sand truck out there to, to fill it in temporarily? They had all these questions about other locations, and we had, were not set up at all our system was so rigid and so specific that there are a lot of different decisions that had to be made that we never planned for. Um, and then as the storm was coming, as after Gustav made landfall, Ike was coming, and the people in Texas, uh, decision makers said, can you do for Texas during Ike what you just did for Louisiana during Gustav? And we just, we couldn't do it alone. We had a small team um, centered at the University of North Carolina. And uh, we didn't have any way for these disparate dis decision makers to look at the data that they needed to see in order to make their decisions. So Jason, I'm going to interrupt you here for a quick question. Um, Mona is asked, does the Project Gateway have specific ways user feedback or feature requests are gathered and handled? Um, the the feature requests generally don't come through the gateway. The feature requests, um, let me go back to this. Um, we have specific, when we started, we, we started with the New Orleans District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we've expanded our list of operators since then. Feature requests tend to come from either our research sponsors, this was all built with, with research money, uh, from our research sponsors or um, someone else who is a potential sponsor, like, I would like to use, I like your data, but I need feature X. Would, what would it take for me to get feature X? And so we can sort of begin a negotiation at that time. Uh, we can't really take requests from just anyone that's using the gateway. The gateway is available to the entire general public, and, um, and so we can only really respond to requests that are funded or or have potential to be funded. Um, okay. So the Sierra Coastal Emergency Risk Risks Assessment uh, Program uh, group actually produced with funding from Louisiana Sea Grant, again, research funding, uh, produced in 2008 our um, real-time online uh, science gateway. 
So all of the supercomputing capacity and all the, the Fortran program that, that produces NetCDF files, that's completely um, hidden to the end user. They see this website. And so uh, that provides all that power and all that complexity is all encapsulated and captured and a very easy to use and intuitive user interface. And uh, one of the things we, so this is the what it looks like across the top. There are a set of buttons to sort of select the type of information that, uh, or the sort of the most general type of information, like if you want to look at Hurricane Ike of 2008 or Hurricane Sandy of 2012, that's the kind of information you'll get across the top. And then down the, the right side, there are accordion menus. And those accordion menus select for different layers to look at wind, wave height or wind speed or water level or other, other pieces of information as well. If you'd like to visit the site, it's online right now. It's always online, uh, sierra.coastalrisk.live. As I said, uh, the, down the side, there's an accordion menu. There are many different, depending on the exact nature of the model run that has been done, there are different uh, layers that are exposed to the end user. And uh, one thing that we discovered you never know how cryptic or how intuitive your user interface is until you show it to someone who is at least somewhat distant either from your project in particular and maybe is familiar with the, the general field that you're talking about or a person who is coming from the, from the general public. And so one great, very easy, very obvious, but very overlooked exercise that we did during the boot camp was have a team from a different program uh, come over who has no background and you give them simple tasks that you think are simple and watch them while they try to do them. And uh, it's very eye-opening to watch things that we just do as second nature, as a no-brainer, um, to watch someone else really have nowhere to begin. And that's, um, that was very eye-opening and, and a valuable exercise and a huge motivator. So that's one of the, one of, we had one of our memorable experiences from the boot camp. We have Google Maps, and you can uh, pan around and zoom and zoom in close and zoom back out. And um, and that Google, Google Maps capability is just gold for for our end users to be able to, to see exactly what they want to see. One of the things that causes, uh, that makes our gateway a lot different from other gateways that are available for coastal hazards information, uh, storm surge information, is that you can click on any point in the computational domain and it will pop up a time series plot, which is probably the most, every across every end user that we've surveyed and talked to and market research that we've done, that is absolutely far and away their favorite and most used feature because we don't have any idea ahead of time, a priori, what the decision maker is going to be looking at. As I said, this, this gateway is online. It's, it's publicly available. We actually don't even know who all is using it. Um, until last year, um, we, had, we had no way of recording who was using it, and they have a wide variety of purposes. They may be operating a chemical plant or an oil refinery or a floodgate or a ferry service or um, looking at potential damage to a levee or a home. And they, we don't know where those assets are. They do. And so they can click on any point in the domain and get time and um, physical information about what's going to happen there. So that, and their jaws drop when they realize they can do that. And so that's really a, the real killer application for, for our gateway. Uh, map layers, uh, if there are other pieces of information, levees, um, schools, hospitals, all of that information can be overlaid on the... Uh, another thing that, the, that is, is key for our, for our stakeholders, they, they're not used to looking at, at this type of model data uh, when they first see it. And so the first thing they want to do is look at measured data. And so we've been collecting measured data locations, tide gauges, river gauges uh, throughout uh, the Gulf and Atlantic coasts so they can in real time compare. 
So it's not this gateway is not just a gateway to model data, it's also a gateway to data. And this is what that, that looks like. You can click on one of those measured measured gauges and you can see in light blue there is the measured data and then yellow is the ADSERC predicted model data. As I said, we um, there's no we up until this year we had no way of knowing uh, through the website itself who was looking at our data, but we you know just like this started with the New Orleans District of the Corps, we have university collaborators and and professional um, stakeholders at a variety of, of agencies and institutions who would email us. Uh, they would just click on the you know contact link on the website and email us and, and ask questions and ask for clarification. And so through that mechanism, just them pulling information from us and, and pinging us, uh, we've built up a portfolio of people that we know are using it and what and use cases and war stories, those sorts of things. And, and those use cases and war stories, after having been through the boot camp, working, we've got a mandate and a, and a roadmap for turning those use cases and uh, so forth into sales leads. So that was where we were. And as Claire said, we were at the boot camp during Hurricane Nate. Uh, Carola Kaiser and I are. We're the lead developers uh, as well as for the various different components. And we're also the operators. So when a storm comes, it's up to us to make sure that everything is flowing smoothly and everything is working as it should. Because one thing that our, our collaborators told us is that if our information is slightly wrong, if we over predict or under predict the flood by a foot or something, and, and we as long as we let them know that we're high biased or low biased or early or late biased or whatever it is, they can handle that, no problem. It, we're talking to people for whom this is not their first rodeo. But what they cannot handle is no information. So if the supercomputer has a file system hiccup and our model run fails, or one year we had during a storm, I don't remember which one, maybe it was Hurricane Ida, we had uh, one of our supercomputer centers a bird hit a transformer that fed the networking cabinet, and so even though all of our model runs were running, um, no one could get to them. They couldn't. They couldn't be viewed because the network was down because of that power outage. So, needless to say, reliability is absolutely the most important thing, even more important than accuracy. And and we have multiple redundant systems for for doing everything that we do. So uh, that so during Hurricane Nate. With both of us at the boot camp, we sort of had to skip out on dinner one of the nights so that we could check on everything and make sure it was running. This uh, this part of the presentation came straight from our pitch deck. One of the deliverables at the end of the boot camp for every team is to produce a what they call a pitch deck, which is just you know analyzing and distilling down what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and why someone should pay for it other than uh, a research sponsor. And so the first step in, in that is a napkin drawing, which is, in a nutshell, what is it that you're doing? And so the first panel is that we are looking at the official forecast track from the Hurricane Center and running that on a supercomputer, which uh, is not useful to our, by itself, is not useful to anybody that we we provide model guidance to. That information goes to the uh, CIRA website, which presents it and provides an interactive user interface for it. And then top right is that website is used by end users to make their decisions to order, um, you know, it could be FEMA. This particular example, that's Gordon Wells on the left in that picture. He's in the Texas State Operations Center looking at the CIRA website, um, looking at the AdCERC results. And uh, so Gordon Wells is in the Texas State Operations Center, and he is giving advice and guidance to <clears throat> to the Texas Task Force One, which does swift water rescues. And this is for Hurricane Florence last month. And uh, New Bern, North Carolina, was really badly flooded during Hurricane Florence. They were there were thousands of 911 calls in the middle of the night. 
And this is an actual picture of him looking at the website to get guidance to tell Te Texas Task Force One where to set up because they need to know where to set up their local headquarters and around New Bern so that they're not going to get flooded and what the winds are going to be and what the water level is going to look like and which areas are going to get flooded. And they used our AdCERC results and the CIRA website to do all that. So that is, that is our end user. So this slide is a napkin drawing that is a nutshell illustration of, of what it is that you do. So the next slide in this slide deck, <clears throat> this pitch deck is the value proposition. And um, as some of the people said during the, I watched the YouTube video of the, of the Gateways Bootcamp. And if you're interested in other gateways and uh, in other domains, there's several very good YouTube videos that really provide a good, good information about the diversity of, of the people that they help. Um, so, as they said, and as some of the other presenters in that said, this value proposition takes an incredibly, non-intuitively long time to come up with because it has to be very succinct, which is, uh, for many people involved in research, that's not a strength. So our value proposition is that the Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment application will help emergency managers make time-critical operational decisions by providing storm impact predictions on an intuitive to use web interface. So that's that's why they should care and that's why they should purchase our products and services. Uh, the next slide in this pitch deck that everybody uh, has to come up with in the boot camp is the current market landscape. And this is another um, unfoundingly hard thing to come up with. You have to think about what you're doing and what you where you want to go and um, and who else is doing something similar? Or what uh, what other ways there are? Uh, one of the memorable quotes that we got, I think it was from Nancy Marin, was um, you have to think about the people that you're planning to help or that you are helping. And if they didn't have you, how would they be solving this problem that you propose to solve? And you're going to be dead in the water if the answer is, well, they're just not solving it. So um, as much as it, as painful as it is to think about uh, you know, in research, we all want to be unique and provide unique contribution, but you have to think about who else is out there that's really doing something that could be considered similar. So we had a couple of axes. One axis is comprehensiveness. What are we providing the totality of information needed by our end users? And the other axis is signal to noise. In other words, if you're too comprehensive, then you're providing anything and everything, including a bunch of information that your your stakeholders and your target audience consider is extraneous and is actually getting them. So um, you want a really high signal to noise ratio, everything they need and nothing they don't. And so we, the National Hurricane Center has pretty good comprehensiveness, but it provides a lot of information that, that, our, our, um, that our stakeholders don't need. Feynman is a really well-regarded um, GIS platform used by the state of North Carolina. It doesn't provide all the information we're providing, but it does provide all the information. Um, it only provides information needed by the state of North Carolina because they're the ones that created it. Um, there's another program called HurryVac, which is used by emergency managers, which uses uh, hurricane center data. It's not comprehensive at all for our end users. It's very comprehensive for, for ordering evacuations has everything needed for ordering evacuations, but nothing beyond that. And so, um, it, plus it does have a lot of information in it that it's, a, it's actually a general purpose platform and it has a lot of information that is not necessarily helpful for our, um, for our target audience. So that was a very valuable exercise that I would not, it would not have occurred to me to do that uh, if it weren't for the bootcamp. So our target audience, uh, which has changed a little bit since the boot camp, um, state emergency decision makers, those are a great audience. Uh, what we found through uh, the, we, we went uh, whole, all out on, on business development and um, market research after the end of the boot camp, because what I realized was if we go back to this um, picture, of our napkin drawing, the third, the third image there, 
the first image is me. I'm the one that's generating the data uh, on the supercomputer through my automated scripting and code, and uh, it's producing all the results in an automated way. And that's I take care of the care and feeding of that. The, the middle is uh, Louisiana State University, Corolla Kaiser. Uh, they they maintain that that's they've got that down. Um, the third image is the one is the tough nut to crack because uh, there are a lot of people who use our data and they love it and they will write um, you know if we if we call upon them to uh, to write a glowing review if we're going to apply for a research grant or something or, or funding from some other agency they'll write a glowing review and, and write use cases that they've actually used it but um, if we talk to those same stakeholders about funding or an annual subscription uh, there are a, that's that's the tough nut to crack. Even now that we've got a good handle on who those people are, we have their email addresses and what they're doing. Um, the government has a lot of rules and restrictions about um, even you know even a federal agency or a state agency that has a, a fantastic fantastically large bu budget and is well funded. There are a lot of rules about what they can spend money on and what they can. And so you have to learn those rules and the ins and the outs of of each one and what their idiosyncrasies are. Um, even if they have the funding to spend on on projects, uh, there are a lot of, of hurdles. And what we found has been the private sector is so much easier to deal with. If you have something and they need it and it's cost effective from them for them to get it from you compared to other ways they might get it or not get it at all, then they can just, you know, it's they can just buy it. And so what we've we're focusing a little bit more on the private sector compared to, to where we started uh, at the end of the boot camp. So our financial model, uh, in the past we've been 100% uh, or maybe 90% funded by research grants. Uh, we would like to have, um, we'd like to monetize our historical data sets through the CIRA website. We would like to have agency specific product revenue. And um, we've done workshops and outreach programs and training um, I would also like to have a commercial sponsor for some of our our, uh, our data layers because I think there's a lot of potential there. So we want to really diversify our our revenue base and our commercial diversity. Three months goal, three month goals that we had coming out of the boot camp was to start with a rebranding strategy. We partially succeeded at that. Um, that is still ongoing. Uh, a service request agreement with SGCI. We knew immediately after, at the end of the boot camp, that the um, usability testing service was going to be key. That the market research, there are market research services that are that were key. Uh, the security um, security review, which is something that we have not made a service request agreement with them. Uh, that is something that I would still really like to do. And also uh, the extended developer support that would, is we have huge gaps in our team in terms of where we want to go, and I can talk a little bit about that in, a, in another couple slides. And uh, to produce a two-year revenue and budget plan, and that is something that we are have made progress on, but it's still um, getting all the getting an estimate of what it costs us to do what we're doing, what it will cost us in the future, um, can be difficult, but we are making really good progress on that. Uh, our six-month goals, final negotiations with, with TxDOT, uh, that we pursued that and continue to pursue that very vigorously. That is one of the agencies, and it's not really TxDOT, it's uh, really the um, Ike recovery money and the Harvey recovery money is a huge political football in Texas right now, and so we're partnering with people who are, are working on that. Um, we had a very high-level meeting with some very influential people who are involved, and in, actually, it's their job to spend five billion dollars of, of RV recovery money. So, um, my philosophy at the time was, if you're if you have a meeting with someone, and their biggest headache in life is trying to figure out how to spend five billion dollars, then I mean, if you can't if you can't um, benefit from that, then you have no one. To blame but yourself, so I'm, I'm still optimistic about that. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has focused a lot of investment on the ADSERC model, and they're very, very keen 
incredibly keen and incredibly forward thinking about um, commercialization. That is a key goal for them. That's a bragging right that they want to, it's a feather in their cap to say that they invest in research money into this ad surf model and now it's it's commercialized with income revenue. So they, they want to put some wood behind the arrow. So we're in a very good position on that. We did not get initial funding from SDMI. Um, not, not that that's a bad thing. There's another state agency in, in Louisiana called the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, CPRA, who um, moved their funding uh, for, for vision support services for operating the hurricane protection system, which is now the, it's no longer the federal government, it's now the state of Louisiana. We were able to um, successful on a services contract with three Louisiana State University to work on that. So that's that is definitely a success story there. Even though it wasn't SDMI, it was CPRA. So starting with the um, with the usability testing uh, coming out of the one of the things about usability testing is that you have to have that sort of shocker that you need it, uh, that it's not as obvious as you think, and that, that um, actually over time you build up a, so much familiarity with your own gateway that the ways that it can be improved are totally invisible, or even the need for improvement. And so that was the motivation that came out of the boot camp. And then with the usability testing, we had um, a really good undergraduate student from uh, Purdue and a really good faculty member from Purdue who, who worked with us on that at no cost to us. And they started out with a just sort of offline review, just going through the site and looking for things that that um, were not intuitive or uh, they have a, a big long checklist of things to look for and things to avoid. And they were able to do that right away within, uh, they started in January and within I think two weeks they had that back to us. And then uh, we had a, a workshop where they did a full-scale usability test with end users, including from FEMA and from the U.S. Coast Guard to, to interview them about, watch them um, use the site and record feedback. All, all of that information was used in a total redesign of the CIRA user interface, and part of that redesign um, was focused on uh, those, those improvements. The other part was focused on creating end user accounts and part of that is, is part of the business model, which was also motivated by the boot camp, the need for user accounts to separate a limited amount of information that we're going to make public from now on from the complete and total rich set of information that we're going to provide to end users from the official decision-making uh, agencies. So um, that was a fantastic uh, success that we had would have had no no other way of, of really um, achieving without the, without the uh, resources from SGCI. So uh, another thing, another sort of eye opener was the need for outreach and market research and knowing your audience. So in January, um, I because you know we want to make sure that we uh, pursue all these things. Uh, what we, we watch our business development and market research budget. There was the AMS conference was in Austin in January, and so as a side trip, we kind of went on a road trip. And uh, I cold called the U.S. Coast Guard, at Sector Houston Galveston, Captain Cuddy, who's on the right in this picture, and uh, based on a tip from our contact at the, at the State Operations Center, I just went in and we just went in and chatted with them about what they need and how they do what they do and what they don't need, and which was a, a critical thing for us to do. And uh, so you can see that I mean this these are this is a, a, the type of group of people that it would be working with our with our data during an event, and um, you know the without a gateway, uh, the supercomputer interface is just you know we can reach so many more people through a gateway than we can um, without a gateway. So the the gateway itself is critical to success. Um, and so um, the, another thing we found out from this road trip that we did. Now, we had hundreds of sales leads, by the way, um, through the uh, through the sign up, the login login session for our gateway. Uh, and what we found was during this road trip and thereafter is that chasing end user funding and doing market research is a full time job. You cannot, you know, our our dude, our technical duties and design, code, maintain, and operate 
our technologies, we have the same responsibilities we had before. And so one of the things that came out of this and these one of the things that we used trips like this to justify was additional uh, end user commercialization funding from the Department of Homeland Security. And we uh, we are working with Nancy Marin on that, or we hope to, or we're planning on doing that. And uh, so one of the great takeaways from the boot camp was networking with the other teams and networking with the, the professionals who are running the boot camp and, and tapping into their expertise. We never would have come across them otherwise. And so um, the sector Houston Galveston suggested several different revenue opportunities to us, including a poor security grant, which is a huge um, pot of money that the Coast Guard spends every year. And uh, they were strongly encouraged us to apply for it and uh, to enable some of our technologies for their use. So um, uh, another uh, revenue opportunity that we're pursuing, although I'm not sure um, where it's going to fit in the plan, is our data sets. One of the things that we identified during the, the boot camp in, co in cooperation with some of the other teams uh, was the value that we have in data that we've already computed. It's not just forecast data, it's also data from, from past events. In fact, right after Hurricane Irma and actually this year right after Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Michael, we had requests from FEMA for our hindcast. So after the storm goes ashore, sort of our first look at who got flooded and who didn't, and how bad the winds were and where. They use that for rapid damage assessment after the storm goes by, and that information can be used. Uh, we can sell that to consultants in future years, because if they suddenly get a project with some municipality or county in Florida, they can go back and look at our IRMA data and look at, at the kind of damage it did. It's also valuable for business development. When we go into a, a stakeholder that we are not, where we want to do business, the first thing they want to know is their storm of record. You know, if it's if it's uh, Texas, they want to know about the Galveston hurricane of 1900 because that was the worst, you know, in terms of human lo life, loss of human life, that was the worst disaster ever to hit the U.S. And so that's the first thing they want to see. They want to see historical data. So we can sell historical data and we can use historical data to sell subscri subscriptions to our site. And those are all strategies that we would not, would not have occurred to us um, if we had not had the, the um, the advice that we received and the networking in contact with professionals that we received at the boot camp. Um, okay, this is my last slide. Every Starting in 2010, I, I created a, an AdCIRC um, training event called the Ad, AdCIRC Boot Camp, and we, it's part of AdCIRC Week. This is a group of AdCIRC users. This was uh, 20, this, the picture is from 2015 in College Park. So there's a, a lot of people who are doing AdCIRC. This is all the research community. And so one thing that coming out of this research community that we didn't have was business acumen or business mentorship or a business mindset. And so there's really nowhere you can go or no, we didn't really have access to anyone who kind of knew what to do. Our, our DHS uh, research funding is going to sunset in 2020. And we are very motivated to, to keep going and keep doing what we're doing and keep buying products and services for, for public safety and for uh, emergencies and natural disasters. And we wanted to keep going with it, but how? We, um, the university, universities tend to have technology transfer offices and commercialization initiatives, but those usually focus on commercializing or licensing intellectual property. In other words, uh, some sort of um, you know, laboratory technique or something like that, or, or a new material that is licensed and patented and copyrighted that they sort of just hand off and collect licensing revenue to outside private companies. Um, so it's not really focused or, or relevant to the, t to the situation that, that we have where we want to keep contact with the university research community. We want to gain end user funding uh, to help support that for the science gateway. Um, so there's really no other place to go to get the same information that we got uh, at the boot camp. So as I said, the, uh, one of the key takeaways from, from this was contact with the people. 
uh, both other teams as well as the professionals that run the, the boot camp uh, and um, getting to know them and, and learning from them and, and uh, they suggested the uh, some follow-up events that we are now key to our, our strategy that we wouldn't have known about otherwise so with that in mind and, and in that same vein um, uh, I'd like to say that um, please contact me if you have any suggestions or, or ideas or additional information that, that you think we could benefit from. Um, so, oh, one thing that I, I, I kind of um, wanted to make sure I mentioned was another incredibly key and important um, service that came from the, from the SGCI um, incubator was the extended development services. Uh, our DHS clients or our research sponsors at this point will be hopefully become clients in the future. They are absolutely key on the cloud. They can't figure out why we're, we're doing anything uh, other than in the cloud. And they, they have a good point. And so uh, the, what the extended developers support has been able to do, we've been working with John Gentle at TAC. And John is a person who understands the cloud and he understands web services. And no, nobody else no, on our team understands how to make use of the cloud or um, he's dockerizing and containerizing. Uh, the components and architecting how the how the containerized components will work together and how they can be put in the cloud, which is key to reliability, which, as I said, is a huge priority for our for our end users. And so uh, we've been working with John. That was part of our uh, our service agreement with with the institute or with the incubator. I mean, and uh, so John, his first job actually. Uh, since we do have a relatively small, disparate team, the CIRA website is the burden of developing it and maintaining it and operating it always fallen on the shoulders of one person. And so John's first job, start containerizing things and making cloud enabling things and, and helping improve reliability, his first job was to go through the code and figure out what's what and produce documentation so that, um, so that we could start, start spinning up other developers and relieve that burden on just one person, which also increases our reliability, not just of the technology, but of the personnel. Because if that one person happens to be attending a Science Gateways boot camp, which is what happened last year, and another person needs to be available, there needs to be, we need to be able to spin that person up. And so John's um, services, which are at no cost to us through the, through the NSF DCI, have been invaluable and, and just giving us a baseline to even begin um, scaling out developers to, to work on this be, be redundant and reliable. And so that, that's his first step and that's mostly complete now, uh, as is most of the architectural uh, conceptualization and a lot of the coding and testing. So we're really looking forward to working with John to demonstrate the cloud-enabled Sierra app at, at the conclusion of his his um, services, his 0.25 FTE service. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you and, and offer to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, we do have one other question. It's actually asked by Mike. Um, he asks, this gateway seems to have huge social impact. Do you have cases even in a, anecdotal from individuals the decisions they made with Sarah and the impact of those decisions. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, was that? Yeah, it's more of a sorry, question we... um, about do you have any uh, use cases or um, incidents where individuals have made decisions with Sarah that you can maybe talk about? Oh, yes. Uh, there, I, we have lots and lots and lots of those. Um, one example is during Hurricane Irene in 2011. Hurricane Irene came up in the Atlantic and uh, went up the U.S. East Coast and made landfall in uh, about the same place as Hurricane Florence did in North Carolina, coastal North Carolina. The U.S. Coast Guard had a um, their command center in Portsmouth, Virginia, 
operates, their, it represents their command and control for all of the U.S. East Coast, and I think Middle East and Africa as well. And so, uh, but Portsmouth, Virginia is actually a very low-lying area, and it's vulnerable to storm surge flooding. And so as Hurricane Irene uh, was approaching North Carolina, they were in Virginia looking at the CIRA website and looking at the ADSERC results. And they have something called a COOP, a Continuity of Operations Plan. I, I think of it as flying the COOP, because what they do, if they think they, that their primary command center is going to be damaged, they they can activate their secondary command center, which in this case is in Missouri, St. Louis. But it's very expensive to do, and so they don't want to do it unless they have to. So they were looking at the CIRA website and looking at the ADSERC results. This, these are the admirals in Port, Coast Guard admirals in Portsmouth, Virginia. And they made a decision to, um, they looked at the inundation and they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to coop. We're going to get on C-130s and we're going to fly to our secondary command center in Missouri. And so they did that. And the morning that, that ADSERC predicted their area would get flooded, it did get flooded and their command center um, went dark. They would have lost all of their command and control during Hurricane Irene for the entire U.S. East Coast uh, if they had stayed, but they were in Missouri and everything was fine and they, they were able to maintain command. And so that that was 2011, and so that year they nominated ADSERC for a Technology Impact Award from the Department of Homeland Security, which ADSERC won. So it was a major, um, from then on, uh, they are, Huge fans of ADSERC. Admiral Brown, who made that decision during Irene, also used the CIRA website to make similar decisions uh, or sim decisions with similar impact during Hurricane Maria. And he said he wouldn't want to go into another hurricane season without it, and he put that in writing. So that's just one story of many specific decisions that have been made with the with the model guidance that we're providing. That's definitely a very impactful story. I'm glad that you were able to share that and get it in writing. Um, we have another question from Catherine. What kinds of discoveries did you learn through the usability evaluation that were surprising to you? Well, you know, the usability evaluation was led by Carola Kaiser, who is not on the call, so she is the person that actually would have the, the most to say about that. Um, I guess we didn't realize that, uh, I mean, there's so many things. Um, uh, one of the things was we didn't realize that you had to kind of know a lot about different storms and their history and sort of how they work in order to even make the user interface work. Uh, one of the, it's one of the off the top of our head usability questions we asked during the boot camp was, um, tell me the peak storm surge from Hurricane Ike in, Galveston Bay or something, and people said, and if you looked at the at the user interface, uh, you could click on, in order to, to find a particular storm, the, first, the button that you clicked on was year, because we all know when Hurricane Ike was, it was 2008, I mean, I mean, that to us, we don't even think about that, but to a person who is just, you know, maybe knows about hurricanes or knows about coastal engineering or something, they're not going to know. If I say, what's the peak storm surge during Hurricane Ike? And the, the, the drop-down box they're looking at is year. They, 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 they can't even get started uh, because they would have to know about a lot of things that they don't know off the top of their heads. And that's something that we totally took for granted and to, is a total showstopper that we never would have noticed if we didn't bother to ask. And it's not the kind of thing, if someone says, oh, your, your site's hard to use and it's not intuitive. Well, I mean, it's really easy to get defensive and say, well, of course, it's great. All you have to do is this, this, and this, and there it is, boom. And so, and that's just one example out of maybe a hundred different details that, uh, that came up during the usability testing. Very good. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Anybody would like to pop in one more thought into the chat channel if I can ask Jason? Can I ask um, in person? <laughs> sure. Uh, hi, Jason. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, 
I was wondering if you speak a little bit more something you mentioned about that it's basically a full-time job of a whole person to do sort of outreach and market research. Um, and so what is your project planning? Are, are you guys going to hire someone or is there other interesting ideas that you got that you guys are planning to do for that outreach and marketing? Yeah, it's it's a crisis actually um, because I was determined to do it, um, and it's a chicken and egg thing. You need to pay the person to do that, and until there's revenue, there's no there's no way to pay that person. And if there's no, you know what I mean, without revenue, you can't hire a business development person, right? Or a or a developer to do your technical job while you do the business development, and that's that's so. Those are two issues. One issue is the chicken and egg thing where you need the money. To hire a business development person, but you need a business development person to get the money. That's problem number one. Problem number two is you may not be able to hire someone who can do a good job of business development because they kind of have to know the audience and they kind of have to know the technology and they kind of have to know what the pain points are for the stakeholders and they kind of have to know what, uh, what the possible revenue streams can be. And, and the ins and outs of different agencies and what their rules are in terms of how they buy things. And right now, the best, they also have to be um, personable. Um, they also have to be flexible and, and good listeners. And so right now, that person, there's no one we could hire that could do that. No one, no one is going to come in um, out of the blue and be able to do that for us because there's, there's too much depth of knowledge they need. And so right now, that kind of is falling to me to be try to be um, the person going out and shaking hands and so forth. And so, um, and that's I, I like that. I couldn't do that for my entire job, but I really enjoy doing that. And I'm we, there's absolutely no one else nearby or at hand that we could get to do that. So I have to do that at least for part of my time, which means I have for the part of my time that I'm not doing tech. We have to hire a developer or more than one to do the tech. And so uh, with me sort of um, bringing them up to speed and, and keeping an eye on what's going on. And so that costs money too. But um, it's, I think it's a little bit easier to get money to do that if you already have a sponsor. So what we're doing right now to solve the, the chicken and egg as well as the um, spread too thin problem is – to go back to our, our sponsor, which is right at this point, the, the best one is DHS in terms of having somebody who's on board. They, like all the things that we've done that turned out well, they are totally uh, committed to commercialization. They see that as a huge, really important priority. So I am targeting them 100% to say, here's what we need to get where we want to go. We need to build up certain products and, and services and a portfolio and a way to sell it and some travel support and a developer to do all the things that are not getting done when the primary lead is, is traveling around and shaking hands. So we are working on additional commercialization focused funding for that specific purpose. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jason. This is Catherine. I want to thank you as well for um, for all that really interesting extra information you provided about to, um, about the project to our uh, to our answering our questions, um, uh, that it's really helpful to get that sense of the the chicken and egg question <laughs> essentially, of which you know um, you don't always think about that as being something that would plague a project. So um, with that, I want to also thank uh, Claire for for being the um, keeper of the questions. <laughs> and, um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar.